Hello Revolution students and welcome to my video on Yuan Shikai and the Early and Republican Era. The purpose of this video and the videos that follow is to give an overview of the key topics related to uh, the Chinese Revolution, area of study one for VCE Revolutions course. So what I intend to do with this video and the coming uh, videos is to cover as many of the topics as I can related to China AOS 1. So with that, let's begin. Um, so uh, with this topic, the early Republican era, we need to go back a little bit and understand what happened uh, prior to the 10th of March 1912. And the key the key event, obviously, is the 1911 revolution, which began on the 10th of October, 1911, the double tenth revolution. Um, and it started with uh, an accidental explosion of a bomb being prepared by um, new army officers in, uh, in Wuhan. Uh, and then it spread from there and spread to various provinces in uh, the south of China and uh, by 1912, pretty much most of the southern half of China had gone over to the revolutionaries. Uh, Sun Yexian, the preeminent revolutionary in China at the time, actually was overseas when the revolution began and then he came back and he was made uh, appointed provisional president of uh, the Republic on the 29th of December 1911. A little later in early Feb, um, Puyi, Emperor Puyi, the last emperor of the Qing dynasty, he abdicates on the 12th of February 1912 and then um, Sun Yixian decides to uh, make a, a compromise with uh, this powerful man here, Yuan Shikai, who was the former commander or the commander-in-chief of the Qing army. And what he did was he made an agreement with Sun Yixian. He said, all right, we will surrender to you um, and I'll surrender the Qing army to you, to the Republicans, so long as you make an agreement with me and make me president. And Sun Yixian uh, did make that agreement. And there are a couple of reasons for this. Uh, he obviously wanted, all along, Sun Yixian wanted a strong and stable uh, government or republic when it was established and he believed that uh, Yuan Shikai was uh, a strong leader because he had the backing of the Qing army. So Sun thought, all right, we'll make an agreement with uh, Yuan Shikai and it also tallied with his ideas in uh, what he'd written previously in the three principles, the San Min Ju Yi, and particularly that second principle uh, in democracy, a democratic principle where there were stages of um, establishing a republic. And he mapped that out and he said uh, one of the early stages was to have a military dictatorship, a strong military dictatorship, which could keep China together because he feared that uh, when the Qing dynasty, when it, once it was overthrown, China might break into lots of little warring states as it happened in the past in China's history. So he wanted to avoid that at all costs. So this is probably one of the key reasons why he decided to agree with Yuan Shikai's offer and to make him the president. The other key aspect of uh, this agreement between Sun Yixian and Yuan Shikai was that uh, Yuan Shikai wanted the government to be located in Beijing rather than where Sun Yixian initially wanted the government to be located, which was Nanjing, sort of in central central uh, China, not far from Shanghai on the Yangtze River. For those of you who don't know, <coughs> Beijing, Bay, and I apologize for my Mandarin here, my, my poor use of tones, Beijing, Bay means north, Jing or Jing means capital, and if you can, you, once you understand that, then you can sort of figure out what Nanjing means. So if Beijing means northern capital, then Nanjing means a southern. Nan is south or southern, southern capital, Nanjing. So we have Beijing in the north, Nanjing in the south. And throughout Chinese history, um, Chinese dynasties 
uh, were either pretty much located, the more modern ones anyway, were located either in Beijing, that was the capital, or in Nanjing. Sun Xian wanted the capital to be in Nanjing. Uh, Yuan Shikai wanted the capital to be in Beijing, and Yuan Shikai wanted the capital to be in Beijing because that was where his power base was. That's where he had all his power. He feared that he he feared that if the government was located in Nanjing, then he wouldn't be as powerful as he could be. Um, so Sun Yixian agreed. So he agreed to make Yuan Shikai the president, and he also agreed to move the capital up to Beijing. So uh, Yuan Shikai was. Uh, became president on the 10th of March, 1912. And we, when we look at his uh, period of rule, so he, he ruled for over four years, okay? And one of the big uh, significant parts of his rule was that he did keep China together. He was that strong leader which Sun Yixian uh, was looking for. Um, and, he, and he, you know, that's a big tick for Yuan Shikai. He did keep China together. He stopped it from breaking up into a lot of small different parts and he did uh, you sort of achieved a, quite a few things. So if we look at that second point there on my um, slide here. So he passed judicial reform, he suppressed opium farming, and if you've looked at uh, uh, earlier Chinese history and China's relations with particularly the European imperialist powers, Britain in particular, um, and the issue of uh, opium smuggling and opium being brought into China, uh, and uh, which uh, the British were responsible for. Um, opium was a blight on the Chinese society. Um, many, many Chinese were addicted to opium. When Yuan Shikai came in, he did uh, manage to suppress it. We'll see um, that uh, once, when we get further along into you know, later decades, the Kuomintang also suppressed it, but the, uh, the CCP are very much against opium, opium farming too. So he suppressed opium farming and he also improved primary education. So that's some key achievements for his early reign. Uh, once, uh, Sun Yixian, once Sun Yixian uh, permitted Yuan Shikai to become president and the government was established up in Beijing, Sun Yixian actually reformed or uh, uh, changed reorganized uh, his revolutionary movement, which was called the Tong Meng Hui, and he uh, reorganized it into a political party, and he called that political party the Kuomintang, so the nationalists, um, and the abbreviation there, you can see the GMD, so the Kuomintang, and he was the head of that, and there were elections early on, and the Kuomintang um, did very well uh, in the elections, they became the most popular party, had the most deputies in the government. However, Yuan Shikai was still the president. So Yuan Shikai, once he was in power, he now realized he had this, I had to sort of uh, share his authority with the Kuomintang, which he wasn't uh, too happy about. And there were various um, conflicts between the Kuomintang and uh, political conflicts and Yuan Shikai. And eventually he banned them outright on the 4th of November, 1913, okay? Uh, Sun Yixian uh, fled China and went to various places. He, he was in Japan for a while and so forth. Um, so, and at this point, it's, it's important to understand. So the Kuomintang uh, was just a political party. It had no army associated with it. Yuan Shikai had the army, so he was able to impose his rule in China. The Kuomintang, led by Sun Yixian, did not have an army. So um, they, were, they were a weaker organization. What this did, once Yuan Shikai banned the Kuomintang, it was an important, um, important, I suppose, stage in the development of the Kuomintang. Um, Sun realized that if he was going to get into power and create a, a proper republic, um, he needed to have uh, the Kuomintang, he needed to tighten party discipline. You can see that third point. And also, he decided to create a revolutionary army of his own in order to contend against and try to um, try to overthrow uh, Yuan Shikai. The other key point, so once uh, Yuan Shikai had banned the Kuomintang, he then did uh, went a few steps further and he banned national and provincial parliaments in February 1914. And this was a, uh, 
a very significant step because it undermined democracy. You can see there that bolded point. It undermined parliamentary, uh, the parliamentary democracy, leaving no viable political authority upon Yuan's death. And it led to a political vacuum in the warlord period. So he, Yuan Shikai, he, he got rid of the Guomindang, he banned them, and then he got rid of uh, these national and provincial parliaments. So he was a dictator in all tense, in tense, uh, in all, you know, pretty much he was a dictator. And um, as a consequence, there was no viable authority when he passed away, when he died. There was no one to, um, you know, to fill his position. No one with his, uh, I suppose, authority anyway. Another key point that happened during this early Republican era. So um, uh, Japan's, Japan's relationship with China, which had, uh, Japan had been growing uh, uh, stronger militarily, economically, ever since they'd gone undertaken the Meiji reforms in the 1860s. And uh, they wanted to have, the Japanese wanted to have an empire uh, like our Western imperial powers, like the, the, the British and the French and so forth. And in order to create their empire, the Japanese realized they needed to uh, expand and they needed to expand and take over land. And the land that was close to them was China's land, particularly Manchuria and so forth. So the Japanese decided on the uh, 7th of May, 1915, or, not, or earlier, but they, uh, they gave these 21 demands to the Yuan Shikai. And these demands, there are the number of various demands. If Yuan Shikai had accepted all of them, uh, China would pretty much have become a puppet state of Japan. And you might ask, well, why didn't Yuan Shikai just say, well, you know, yeah, you can, I, I, I don't want your 21 demands, take them back with you. Well, what the Japanese were going to give him in return was um, loans, money to run his government. So he made a compromise and he accepted some of the demands, not all of them. Okay, and you can see uh, what, uh, what sort of demands he did accept. So he accepted a modified version of the 21 demands, giving Japan economic rights in Manchuria and Inner Mongolia. Control of the Liaodong Peninsula. So the Liaodong Peninsula is that sort of that bit of land which is across the water from Korea. Um, I think it's in Shandong province, which we're going to look at in more detail later on. And the consequence of him accepting, Yuan Shikai accepting the 21 demands, was it weakened his popular support. Okay? Chinese people started turning away from him. The, the whole purpose of the Republic, the aim of the Republic, Sun Yixian, uh, and the three principles, what the Chinese people had wanted for so long was they wanted to get rid of the Qing dynasty, which uh, was a, the, run by the Manchu and which Han Chinese saw as a foreign, um, a foreign dynasty. And they also wanted to get rid of and remove all foreign control from the European powers. So you would have studied this. So places like Hong Kong, Shanghai itself was broken up into different areas controlled by the British and the French, uh, the Americans and so forth. There were various treaty ports up and down the, the Chinese coast controlled by Europeans and or, or the US. And what these treaty ports allowed these Europeans to do was pretty much, um, you know, trade freely with China. They could tax in them. Even things like uh, the British had British citizens uh, had the right to be um, judged if they committed any crimes by British law in China rather than Chinese law. So uh, the Chinese, the Han Chinese, uh, this grated against them, this foreign control of their country, so they wanted to get rid of it. They had hoped when Yuan Shikai came in and with the Republic that uh, this would occur. But with the, uh, his acceptance of the 21 demands, it was going back to the old thing again. The Japanese were now coming in and taking over, you know, increasing their control of China, and the Chinese people did not like it. So that weakened his popular support. And you can see that other point there, it also increased Japanese control of China. Then we get into, you know, the 19, uh, by 1932, they take over full control. We'll get to this, we're sort of jumping a little bit ahead. Um, of Manchuria and then the full blow, 
full-blown Sino-Japanese War starts in 1937 and continues right up until 1945. But this, this, uh, this 21 demands is, I suppose, the first step of the Japanese, um, you know, increasing their influence in China. So this was a, a misstep by Yuan Shikai. He lost uh, popular support as a consequence of that. And then the next, the next, uh, next significant act which eroded his authority within China was he decided to assume the title of emperor on the 1st of January 1916. So if we have a look at that key quote there, down below his, that beautiful picture of Yuan Shikai, and that key quote, the rub, and this is from him. This is what he said when he uh, became president. The Republic is universally recognized as the best form of state. Let us henceforth forge ahead and endeavor to reach a state of perfection. And I'll bolder this part here. Never shall we allow the monarchical system to reappear in China again. So the bolded here, never shall we allow the monarchical system to reappear in china again that's what we call a lie okay so you, you, did did yuan shikai always intend to become emperor hmm, possibly possibly um I, I think he did and he decided to do it so on the first of january 1916 supposedly there was these letters written by people from all over china saying please please yuan shikai assume sh assume the position of emperor um so anyway Whatever, whatever the credence there was, or whether these, uh, whether these uh, letters were true or not, as soon as he became emperor, uh, m most Chinese were very unhappy about this, and his own generals and many provincial governors were unhappy about this as well, and they forced him to renounce the throne on the 22nd of March 1916. His uh, authority was further weakened, and then eventually he died. Uh, only a couple of months later, um, on the 6th of June 1916, uh, the Chinese love numbers, and you can have a look at that, those numbers and the correspondence of numbers. So that death date, 666, ooh. Um, if we look at those days, the double going back to the double tenth, um, very, uh, very, you know, um, it's always of significance these dates. So anyway, upon his death, and if we go back to the, the earlier points about him first banning the Guomindang and then getting rid of the provincial and national assemblies or parliaments, with his death, there was no leader in China strong enough to keep China together, okay? And what happened, because there wasn't a leader strong enough to uh, keep China unified, <clears throat> Uh, Yuan Shikai's generals and military leaders, uh, wherever they were in the provinces, they started carving up China and controlling small parts of China themselves. They had their own private armies and they pretty much ruled these parts of China as their own states, as their own nations. And this warlord period ensues, that's what we call the warlord period, and it pretty much co continues right up until the northern expedition. Um, in uh in the 1920s so um for almost a good decade or more good decade um china is uh controlled by the warlords some of these most of the warlords were not good were bad some of them were okay um but they pretty much they ran their provinces as their own private nations they had their own private armies they taxed uh they ran those governments in those places and the people in the provinces uh, that were run by warlords were often looking more, or, you know, as it says there, regionalism resurfaced. Um, people were more concerned about their own uh, region and more loyal to their warlord than thinking of China as a nation itself, okay? And it's only with uh, the Northern Expedition uh, when the Guomindang, and we'll get to this, uh, marched north with the help of the CCP and the Comintern um, in uh, 1926, 27, that, uh, that um, unity is re-established and China as a nation um, is, uh, is given birth again, I suppose. 
Okay, and two key historical interpretations related to uh, Yuan Shikai's rule. So the first one's uh, by John King Fairbank, and it is, he, Yuan Shikai, knew how to make the old system work, but it turned out that he had no vision of a new system. And I think, obviously, that's a really good point because uh, Yuan Shikai decided to make himself emperor rather than president. So he was trying to go back to and create a dynasty for himself and take China back to the, um, the old imperial system. So that's historical interpretation number one. Historical interpretation number two is from Tom Ryan, and he is an awesome author. For all his thoughts, for all his faults, Yuan Shikai held China together, a considerable achievement given its size and ethnic diversity. So, um, and we have to recognize that with Yuan Shikai's rule, he did keep China unified. Um, and it wasn't such an easy task if we look at what happened after he died and the warlord uh, period when there was no one warlord strong enough to reimpose their rule over all of China until. Um, Zhang Jishe, Chiang Kai-shek, came along with the Guomindang. So anyway, uh, that's the two historical interpretations. That's uh, my uh, overview of Yuan Shikai and the early Republican era.